Our next speaker is Dr. Sangi Bular of Wise Kids, who's uh, recently completed uh, a study of the digital literacy of uh, Year 9 pupils uh, in conjunction with the Children's Commissioner for Wales, S4C and Logicalis. So, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Sangi Bular. Right. The key, I think everyone's very aware of how technologies have really changed, and it's not just the technologies and the access, but it's actually transforming society, education, and how we learn, socialize, develop business ideas, and so on. And, and the opportunities available to the average user today are huge. If you were to consider the, the world of a young person, um, all these Little icons on the screen here would be very familiar to you. You've got World of Warcraft, Snapchat, young people have Tumblr and Twitter, they're on WhatsApp, Instagram, and there's a very big use of social media uh, by young people. But perhaps what we're going to talk about and what I want to focus on is are, are our young people as digitally literate as they could be? Are they, um, do they possess the knowledge, skills, understanding to maximize opportunities online? And in this, I will make a distinguish, I will distinguish between digital literacies and I think computing, which are um, you know, often put on, in, in very close proximity, but perhaps they're two equally important components. So this is a research project really to look at how skilled young people are. Year nine pupils were selected from across Wales. Um, it's a project that got initial backing from the Children's Commissioner's Office, Logicalis, S4C, and these are some of the questions we wanted to consider. For example, how are young people using the internet and technologies? When we were looking at it with two lenses, the social use and the educational use. Um, what is their knowledge and what are their skills and practices around uh, safety online? What stops them participating online? How would they like to be engaged in the classroom? What would make them more digitally literate? What sort of provision would that be? Um, and what I'm, finding, um, what I'm going to share with you today are just some preliminary insights from the qualitative work. We've basically done qualitative, two rounds of qualitative, and we've just finished um, a, a detailed questionnaire with 2,000 young people looking at um, a whole range of things around their digital media use, their perceptions, their skills, and that will be available in September. So we're actually in analysis. But I want to share with you some of the things that are starting to come out. Uh, to begin with, I want to talk about what do we mean by digital literacy here. And it, in, in very simple terms, it's about the skills, knowledge, understanding to be able to operate in a network world, to understand the meaning of being an online participant, to have the tools and skills to be able to create content, connect with communities, um, to keep yourself safe, but to also develop personal learning networks, to develop your own educational uh, resources, to, to be able to connect with learners across the world. And there are two people I wanted to point you to who I think have something really important to offer in this dialogue. The first gentleman is Howard Rheingold. He's a visiting uh, lecturer at Stanford University. And he's got a really important statement, which I think is a challenge that we are going to have to come across, uh, we are going to have to deal with. And he says, knowing how to make use of online tools without being overloaded with too much information is an essential ingredient to personal success in the 21st century. So in an age of Facebook and Tumblr and Twitter and all sorts of you know, um, other, other uh, access to technology, are our young people actually able to use technologies for benefit? And he points us to five key digital literacies, and he calls them attention, participation, collaboration, critical consumption of information, or crap detection, and I love that very much. Think about crap detection versus internet safety. One has a much better energy to it. And the third one, and the last one rather, is network smarts. And he explains how attention works and how we can use our attention to focus on tiny relevant portions of that huge tsunami of information. He talks about the need for quality participation, so learning from the best of bloggers, the best of um, internet citizens and uh, people who use Twitter effectively, um, and, and other online communities which are uh, really important for our young people to be able to connect with and learn from. He also talks about um, successful online collaboration, 
And that's really important again. It's not something that just happens. Young people are very confident, they're very able to collaborate with their friends and organize their social lives and do a whole range of things. But these are some of the higher order thinking skills, the deeper thinking and the encouragement we need to give them to stretch themselves to use um, uh, you know, technologies in ways that will bring about other success. Michael Wesch is another professor at Kansas University, and he created this fantastic video some years ago that went viral, um, called The Machine Is Us. Um, and he talks about, he makes a statement that's really important, that first statement, the new media landscape is a pull environment, which makes it essential that we inspire students to seek out the knowledge that's out there. This content isn't fundamentally different, but the environment demands more curiosity and imagination. And I think this is something we really need to think about as educators, those of us who have a, a role in the classroom. And very importantly, he says, we have to recognize in our society that new media are not just new means of communication or new tools, but it actually changes what can be said, how it can be said, who can say it, who can hear it, and what messages will count. So if you had the knowledge, skills, and tools to have a powerful presence online, you would be at a, an advantage. And that's something I'm talking about, really. So I want to share with you, um, through some clips here, what young people have actually said in our um, group interviews and one-to-one -one interviews. So these are just some excerpts. Um, the first one is a quote from a young man. Um, he was one of a very few who had his own YouTube channel, and he says, I go on my YouTube channel as soon as I get back from school to see what's happened while, whilst I've, I've been out. I don't actually really do my homework at home. And just so you have an understanding, he's got 127 videos, 50 subscribers, and over 6,000 views. Um, he also likes playing games, and I think this is something that education can learn from. What is it about games that make young people engaged? And how can we make our lessons um, in ICT more engaging in that same way? Uh, and he talks about them being very fast-paced action because you're never without a moment when nothing's happening. Basically, something's happening all the time. But then he also likes creating, and, and that's really important. can build whatever you want. You can construct stuff like you can spawn a wooden plank, make something out of that. You can modify stuff. And these 3D environments and games that young people are participating are giving them new skills. And this is where computing and computer programming comes in, because if we can inspire them to create themselves those sorts of games, this is where we would have developed both their technical skills as well as the literacies to then showcase those, what their creations in a, in a networked uh, environment, the internet. We talk about a young girl who also watched tie-dye tutorials on YouTube and to make them, and she then uh, got uh, her friends involved and managed to sell some t-shirts. Um, on homework and revision, what we were seeing was very limited use of a narrow range of websites, and I think this is something that we need to look at quite carefully. So for lots of young people, it was a case of sticking with Google or using Wikipedia um, or a limited range of websites. One or two of them, um, quite a few of them mentioned trusted sites like BBC uh, Bite Size. Um, occasionally, though, we saw instances of informal learning, and this is certainly happening. So, for example, a young man who's being selected for um, an academy program for football, he spends a lot of time watching football drills. We saw young people who were actually watching exercise routines on YouTube. Um, we also said, we were asking them about things like with their mobile phone, if they didn't know what to do, what would they, you know, where would they go? Often they say, oh, we'll go on YouTube and put in the question and get the answers. So, access to this knowledge is changing, um, you know, changing learning, really. Um, and when we come to, to how they collaborate with, with, for homework, things like FaceTime and Kick or Snapchat would all be used to do screen grabs, to share, ask questions if they missed a lesson. So we're seeing a, a sort of pervasive use of technology, not for one particular thing, but across the board. But then there are other challenging issues, and you see the, the, the sort of struggles that they have in trying to navigate this space. So for example, there is peer pressure, and when you are public, you know, it, when I was growing up, there was not a technology that allowed me to be public 
across the world. And, and I think that's the key difference here. So this young man said, I never put my status up because I thought I'd never have enough likes. And that was when he was year seven, in year seven. And now he, um, he's in year nine. He says, now I wouldn't mind it so much. Um, and interesting across schools, some schools were told that uh, Wikipedia was good. Others said, oh, I don't trust Wikipedia. Um, and you also see young people self-regulating, and I'm really impressed by this. A lot of them are very aware of distraction. They're very aware that they could you know, uh, go off in lots of directions, temptation to play games when they should be doing homework, um, going on Facebook all the time. So again, you know, we're, we're seeing examples of that. And then that last one, I put in there a desire to belong. And I think this is really important because, as Helen Milner said earlier today, there is an assumption that all our kids are online. And this is where the role of parents comes in really strongly. Um, in this young case, Sam, he wanted access to a whole range of social technologies. He wanted to be part of his set, so much so that he had an old phone, he had Bluetooth on it, he would take photos on Bluetooth, pass it to his friends, just to be part of a set that he couldn't be part of because his parents didn't think it was safe for him to have Facebook or any of the other social media. They you know, were against him getting a smartphone. Now, the role of the parent is really, really important here. And, you know, he actually was trying his level best. And the reason the parents didn't want were twofold. One, the sister had been bullied on social media, so they were trying to protect the son. And the second thing was, I think, um, uh, just from the press, I think they, they felt that there, was a, a, a lot, there were lots of uh, uh, sort of scary issues that this would open up a can of worms. So I think as government and policy makers, we need to think about the messages we give uh, parents because I think one of the key issues is having access to the internet and the skills and knowledge to use it safely and competently is a right today. It's as important as a textbook today. And I think we cannot be complacent and think that every child has access, because it's not necessarily always the case. Um, there's a lot on privacy and safety again, um, you know, with young people expressing sometimes uncertainty about what, what to do, but many of them Google themselves to check how much of information was out there. Um, and then sometimes they get the wrong information. For example, in one instance, a young, uh, a young lady in the school was saying about her Facebook, uh, you know, they'd had a talk from the police about Facebook and the, the policeman had come and said that to beware that all the pictures they uploaded on Facebook could be used by dating um, websites, you know, that Facebook owned the photos and could, could use their photos. Now, this is misinformation. We cannot be, you know, we need to be careful that in the rush to keep them safe, we don't start scaring them with the wrong story either. Um, so really what I'm saying here from our findings, being able to use, you know, there are opportunities and challenges. And what we need to think about is a consistent approach to help young people um, use these network spaces for exploration, to share and access learning, collaborate, participate, develop those new skills and knowledge. And at the same time, they need to manage their personal interactions and safety. Um, and I think you know, this is something we need to think about consistently because being able to navigate and use the digital space is key today. And that's really what we mean. So very quickly, in the last couple of minutes, I want to just say, talk about the key things we're seeing. In, what did we find in terms of provision? Well, technology access across schools is, is irregular. Some schools had iPads, some schools didn't. Some schools had Wi-Fi networks, but the kids were not allowed to bring them in. Some teachers said you could use your phone in class. Some teachers said no. Some, te some, uh, some teachers were going to use Twitter, and in some cases, pupils were told they couldn't interact with their teachers on Twitter and Facebook. And so I think there is a need for synchronized messages from teaching and learning and both the provision as well. And I think in terms of teacher capability as well, we need to encourage our teachers to actually develop these competencies. Um, and I, again, this requires vision. Um, we need to capitalize on the learning that we know is happening outside of school. Uh, and encourage pathways to get young people to become more critical, participative learners. How can we get them to develop collaboration, participative skills? We could do that through lessons, whether that's geography or whether that's history or maths or drama. Get them to engage with what does identity mean online? How do you manage privacy? Who owns data today? How do commercial companies work? And these are intriguing questions. And these are the sorts of questions we need our kids to be able to answer. 
Um, again, homework, there was a lot of um, uh, talk about cutting and pasting, so this is again something we need to address. What is the point of homework, really? Um, and we see, and I won't go into a lot of those things, but the slides are available afterwards. I think the key point I want to make is how can we develop the deep, deep thinking that is needed by our young people so that they understand the implications of being a network citizen and they're able to maximize opportunities online. And I think parents are key cog in this, in, in this, um, this challenge for us. Um, and I think you know, school and learning are all connected and learning is not just happening in school and that's something we need to learn from. Thank you very much. Thank you.